is over us there's nothing
Wow, so quiet in here. Almost like a lot of, you know, murmuring and stuff like that. Hey, thanks, Ray. Appreciate that. Thank you so much. Well, good morning. How's everyone doing this morning? Well, welcome to the Sanctuary Church. So glad to have you guys here. It's your first time. So glad you're here. We're going to give you a hug, even if you don't like it or not. So it's probably going to happen at some point today. So be ready for that. Um, just excited to be down here. Just got in with my boy James. We have Carl and Dina. And uh, we're so excited to be able to lead and to worship together this morning. And everyone online, hi. Good morning to you. Thank you so much for tuning in. Love to know where you're tuning in from and what's going on in your world. And, uh, and come visit. I know a lot of people do. They'll be online and they're like, I got to go to this place. But you're totally welcome. So uh, let's stand up and let's just worship together.
Just hear you guys, come on. Yeah. 
can be seated. Let's pray together. God, because you are in control of all things, none of us are here by accident. Every single one of us is here by divine appointment, and that means that you have something very specific to say to each of us. You know us better than we know ourselves. You know our fears, our insecurities, our sin, our secrets, our struggles. You know us fully. And therefore, you know how to reach us and what we need. And so I pray this morning that you would reach us right where we are, wherever we are. We're not here this morning because we are good or faithful people. We're here this morning because you are good, because you are faithful. And so, God, I pray this morning that you would show us your glory. Sweep us off of our feet by your amazing grace. Show us your outrageous mercy. Help us to believe that we are forgiven fully and finally. That the sins we can't forget, you don't even remember. That is true, and it's so difficult to believe that because we are so often plagued by guilt and shame and regret. These things occupy our minds and distract us, and yet you are there to quietly and sometimes loudly remind us that you don't even know what we're talking about. You forget our sins. You remember them no more. And so this morning, each and every one of us woke up with something so much better than a clean slate, a second chance. We woke up this morning perfectly loved and perfectly accepted in spite of our unclean slate, in spite of our guilt. And I pray this morning that you would help me rest in that, 
that you would help us all rest in that and that you would give us the faith and the trust we need to believe that that is true. And that as a result of believing that is true, we will feel lighter, filled with peace, more free. We know that you can do these things and we pray that you will. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, I have the privilege this morning of introducing you to Brittany Mastracchio, right? <laughs> I had to practice that one. Um, but Brittany leads Young Life here in Jupiter. And for those of you who don't know much about Young Life, it's been around for a while. She'll tell you more about it. Um, I've known many, many people over the decades whose lives were changed because of the ministry of Young Life. Um, and uh, we were sort of trying to figure out youth ministry. Reagan and Tim had previously led our student ministry, and then they got pregnant, had a baby, and all of life changed, okay? So we were, you know, we were trying to figure out, like, okay, what do we do next? And about that time, uh, Brittany and Stacy connected, and she said, I lead Young Life in the area, and we're looking for a new place to meet, and we would love to rent your space if possible, uh, which was a total answer to prayer because now instead of having to sort of run a student ministry ourselves, we just tell our students, go to Sweet 16 on Monday nights and Young Life handles it all. And so I don't know how many of you knew that, uh, but it's been a really sweet and strategic partnership between the sanctuary and Young Life. So we asked Brittany to come this morning, uh, introduce herself, and just sort of share a little bit about what goes on Monday nights in Sweet 16. So Brittany, welcome. <laughs> Brittany Mastracchio. You nailed it. You really did. You really did. As I still struggle because I went from Taylor was my maiden name to Mastracchio. You can imagine. Um, yes, I'm the area director for Young Life here in Palm Beach County. Um, I've been here now for, um, I think it's been eight or nine years. Um, but Young Life has been around for a really long time. Um, when people ask me, what is Young Life? It's as long as I've been a part of it, I did Young Life when I was in high school, it's still really hard to describe to people. Um, we call our weekly meetings club, and so if you've heard of Young Life, the first thing you might think of would be club. And if you were to drive in the parking lot on Monday nights through and looked in the windows of Sweet 16, it might just look like a bunch of high school kids broke in there and are throwing a party. Um, but don't worry, there are people there in charge, even though it might not look like it. Um, if you um, are around teenagers, they are so full of life. Um, and that's what Monday night um, is a very clear picture of. Um, we just hope that every high school kid, when they walk in that door, they can find this space where they can belong. Um, and they feel known, and they feel seen, um, and that that hour they're there, they can just be a high school kid, an actual high school kid that doesn't have to think about the pressures and the insecurities and the doubts and all these things that constantly fill their minds. Um, and so that's essentially what Monday night is, and that's what we, we put on this. It feels like a party for them so that they will get a taste of what a life with Jesus can look like, which is abundant life. Um, but really the heart of Young Life is in our 35 volunteer leaders. Um, most of them are college age. They go to college at Palm Beach Atlantic. Um, but then we have some who are adults and out of college and have stuck around and have careers. Some of our college students even work multiple jobs so they can volunteer with Young Life. Um, some get a job at a middle school or a high school as a part-time job to coach so they can meet more middle school and high school students in a different venue. 
Um, but the thing is when, say, I'm a young life leader and I meet a sixth grader because we have middle school ministry too, my hope is that I will know that sixth grader for the rest of their lives. Um, when I was in college, I was a volunteer leader um, in Tennessee, and I have been in multiple high school girls' is wedding when they decided to get married. I was a bridesmaid in their wedding, and some of them were in mine. Um, so it really is this lifelong relationship that Young Life leaders have with um, middle school and high school students. Um, and the thing, especially here in Palm Beach County, I would say teenagers are searching for hope and for meaning and for belonging. And Young Life leaders do that with them. Um, we meet them where they are. Um, I don't know if you have been around like the teenager world, but there does feel like there's this line in the sand, an invisible line where adults can't cross. Um, if you go to a high school football game, they all sit in the same section and adults sit over there. But you might know, if you went to a Jupiter High football game, you might notice um, some kids that look a little bit older than high school and they're young life leaders. And so when we step into a student section, we want to meet high school kids where they are. Um, we're not saying, hey, just come to this thing. We're going to their things. We're showing up in their lunchrooms. And if you have not been in a high school lunchroom, it's terrifying. Um, even when you're way out of high school. Um, but we meet them where they are and hope to build a relationship with them so one day we can tell them about the love of Jesus and what he has for them. Um, we call that in the young life world, earning the right to be heard. Um, we're a very relational ministry. Um, and so we have multiple ministries in Palm Beach County. Um, on Monday nights, like you know, our high school ministry meets in Sweet 16. Um, and that serves mostly kids that live in the Gardens and Jupiter area. Um, on Tuesday nights, our middle school ministry meets at another church, um, and that serves middle school students pretty much heavily in the Jupiter area, but we have some Gardens and North Palm kids that come too. And then we have college ministries at Palm Beach Atlantic and Florida Atlantic University that meet on Thursday nights. Um, I would just really love to say to each of you how grateful that I am for this partnership. I don't take that lightly at all. Um, the gift of having a consistent space for high school kids to come um, has been a huge gift for us. Um, even this past Monday, we had 60 high school kids in that room. And you all are playing, think you all are playing a part in all those stories. Um, it looks really wild from the outside up until the last 10 to 15 minutes. And that's when a young life leader gets up and shares about the love of Christ. And it's dead silent. Um, and I believe that Sweet 16 is built on holy ground because of that. Um, because lives are being changed slowly and tra being transformed because of this space. And so I would like to close and pray for you all um, because we are really, really grateful for this partnership. So thank you. Jesus, thank you um, for today and this place. And I just thank you for um, the body of Christ in the church, the sanctuary, and that um, you continue to bless them in many ways and just how they are changing this community, especially in Jupiter. Um, I pray that you continue to show them favor in all the ways that they are getting into the thick of it in people's lives. And so thank you for um, their leadership, especially in this community of Jupiter. In your name I pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the sanctuary. We're so glad to have you with us this morning. I have a few announcements for what's coming up. Today is the church picnic. It will start right after service and go until 2 p.m. Everyone is invited. 
Lunch will be served next door in Suite 16, followed by lots of activities and games led by the Evans family. It's going to be a lot of fun. You don't want to miss it. I really hope you stick around after service. The 10-week workshop, Discover, led by Stacey Chavidjan, begins this Tuesday, April 16th. All women are invited to participate in the workshop. Throughout the 10 weeks, you'll discover tools to help reconcile daily life. The group will meet here at the sanctuary Tuesday evenings from 6 to 7.30. We ask that you register for the workshop either on the church website under the Discover event or in the Open Door Facebook group. Reach out to Stacy if you have any questions. This Friday, April 19th, Open Door is hosting dinner and line dancing for all women. Dinner is at 6 and line dancing is at 7. I hope you make plans to be here at the sanctuary this Friday at 6 p.m. That's all for announcements. Thanks for joining us this morning. I'll see you next week. At this time, I'd like to dismiss children kindergarten through fifth grade to go to Harbor. Your teacher this week is Jenna, and she'll be waiting for you in the back of the auditorium. And for everyone else, I invite you to stand up, turn to your neighbor, and say hi. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Brittany, wherever you are, thank you. Thank you. We, too, are super excited about the partnership with Young Life. Um, I've told people for years now that the probably the most gifted people persons I have ever met in my life, and I, I'm a people person, and uh, the people persons that have outshined my people personing skills by far are Young Life leaders. I mean, these are people who love people. And so um, that is, as she mentioned, a huge, huge part of who they are and what they do. So if you have a sweet 16, um, you heard Reagan mention the picnic today. Uh, if you didn't responsibly register and sign up like you were clearly instructed to do. Um, it's one thing, when you focus on the message of grace, sometimes people become rule breakers and rebellious and they don't give a rat's, well, you know what I mean. Um, but uh, you can still come. Uh, you can still sign up today. Um, I think tickets are 10 bucks, and that just basically covers food costs. So please stay. It promises to be a time where uh, you get to know people that maybe you don't know. Um, we get to hang out. The Evans apparently are in charge of games, and they have a PhD in gaming. So, um, so it'll be fun. It'll be fun. And the games include not just kids, but adults, right? It's mainly adults. Yeah, yeah. So there's some very extravagant uh, scavenger hunt uh, planned. So just, yeah, stick around. Uh, one of the things, you know, we're, we're a small church and we don't, we are intentionally under-programmed. We don't have something every night of the week. Um, and we do that on purpose. But on those occasions when we do have things like this, where community can be established, people can talk, hang out, get to know one another, get to know people they don't know, um, we take that seriously. So if you can, stick around. We'd love to have you stick around. Okay, um, this is part eight in a series that I entitled Life Without God. Um, we've been making our way through different sections of the biblical book of Ecclesiastes. 
um, and we took a two-week hiatus. Last week was table talk. Stacy and I were up here answering questions, talking about Ecclesiastes and things that I've preached on in Ecclesiastes. Um, and then the week before was Easter. So, uh, so we've taken a two-week hiatus, but we're back, and it's just this week and next week. That's it. Two more Sundays uh, of this series, and I always get a little bit nervous when a series is ending because that means I have to come up with a new series. Um, so pray for me. I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to do yet. I should by now, but I don't. Um, but this morning, I want to look at Ecclesiastes chapter 11. It's only 12 chapters. Um, Ecclesiastes chapter 11, and I want to focus on verses 7 through 10. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verses 7 through 10. The writer says this, Light is sweet. How pleasant to see a new day dawning. When people live to be very old, let them rejoice in every day of life. But let them also remember there will be many dark days. Everything still to come is meaningless. Young people, it's wonderful to be young. Enjoy every minute of it. Do everything you want to do. Take it all in. But remember that you must give an account to God for everything you do. So refuse to worry and keep your body healthy. But remember that youth with a whole life before you is meaningless. Encouraging words from the writer of Ecclesiastes. <clears throat> Let's pray together. God, give us ears to hear and minds that understand and hearts that receive your truth, which alone can set us free. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as we've seen week after week, Ecclesiastes is a bold, an honest, courageous look at the ways that we try to find happiness and meaning in life apart from God, which is why I've said each week that the subtitle to Ecclesiastes could easily be The Search, because the writer, and we're not exactly sure who that is, uh, some people say King Solomon, other people say that it was someone taking on a Solomonic persona. It doesn't really matter. Um, but the writer has been combing through life under the sun, looking for lasting happiness, for something to satisfy, for something, someone to fill voids, the voids that he feels. He's been searching high and low for meaning and purpose in things like Wisdom and wealth, power and accomplishments, relationships and pleasure, winning and trying to control things. And he still hasn't found what he's looking for. So we get to chapter 11 and the search goes on. He keeps looking, he keeps examining, he keeps excavating life under the sun to try to find that missing piece of the puzzle that he feels but can't fully identify. And in these verses, the ones I just read, he addresses the vanity of trying to find ultimate meaning and purpose in our age and our stage in life. I think a lot about that these days. Um, I'm 51, and it seems like just yesterday I was 31. Um, I'm embarrassed to admit that aging has not been easy for me. Um, I struggle with it. I see pictures of myself from just 10 years ago, and I wonder what happened. Um, as I age, I realize just how much of my value and my significance came with youth. The energy I had, the ambition I had, the opportunities I had, my dreams, my youthful looks. Um, I mean, five or six years ago when I would tell people that I was a grandfather, they would say, wow, you look way too young to be a grandfather. They don't say that anymore. They're like, oh, that's sweet. I'm like, wait a second. You're supposed to say. Um, I mean, for the first time in my life, cosmetic surgery is very understandable to me, okay? It's very plausible. Um, but when you're 
when you're young, you don't, you don't think about getting old. You just don't. I mean, you have your whole life ahead of you, and there's so much good in that. I mean, he says in verse 9, the first part of verse 9, young people, it's a wonderful thing to be young. Enjoy every minute of it. Do everything you want to do. Take it all in. I mean, you and I both know that the, the blessings of, of youth are numerous. Stamina that we had, opportunities, ignorance of passing time, <laughs> um, the newness of things, the excitement at seemingly endless possibilities. Your whole life is ahead of you. Getting married, starting a family, becoming a parent, beginning your career, making your mark, dreaming about the mark you want to make, earning your own money, not being dependent on the people you had been dependent on for so long. There is an aliveness, an excitement, a rush in being young. If God gave me three wishes, okay, three wishes, after wishing for $5 billion, okay, um, but if God gave me three wishes, my wishes would be steeped in vanity, okay, I'm embarrassed to say. I would probably ask him to give me back 11 years of my life, put me at 40 years old, and then just keep me there for like 30 or 40 years. Um, that was a time in my life where I felt more alive than I had ever felt. I was at the top of my game professionally. Life seemed to be going exactly the way I had dreamed I wanted it to go. And then things happen. All of that changes. I loved being young. I didn't appreciate it as much as I should have because, as I said, when you're young, you don't think about getting old. But I, I loved it. Loved it. I loved the energy I had. <laughs> I loved the opportunities I had. I loved the dreams I had. I loved being a young dad to young kids. I loved it. Nothing but fond memories of being young. And some of you who are older than I am are looking at me without any sympathy whatsoever because you think I'm still young, and I appreciate that. But that's just because you're really old, okay? Um, uh, <laughs> some of you are really old. I'm just kidding. Um, but, uh, but I'm feeling my age. I'm feeling it. Um, you see, the great, and I thought about this a lot yesterday as I was preparing, that the great and dangerous temptation of youth, and you don't realize it when you're young, but the great and dangerous temptation of youth is to put your happiness and your significance and your sense of purpose and worth and all those things that go along with being young. We don't realize it when it's happening, but when we're young, so much of our identity is anchored in things like our dreams, our ambitions, our youthful look, our youthful energy. We don't realize it. And that's why aging is so hard for so many people. Aging can usher in an identity crisis, either a big one or lots of small ones. And it's in those moments you begin to realize that I had anchored my identity in the things of youth, the newness of things. It's why a lot of people in midlife have serious crises because they're trying to recover a sense of what it felt like to be young. There was such an aliveness to it. Marriages end. People make some really stupid decisions in the middle of life because they're trying to go back and recover something that they once felt something that they once had. Um, I mean, I joke about cosmetic surgery, but my gosh, I mean, the cosmetic surgery industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. Well, that tells us something. It tells us that we desperately want to be young again, stay young, feel young. Um, it's, it's hard. It, it, it shows us where we had previously placed our identity where our worth came from, where our sense of purpose came from, where our feeling alive came from. Um, 
It's not just, for instance, that your body doesn't look or feel the way it did. It's because you placed your identity in looking and feeling good. It's not just that your youthful dreams didn't pan out the way you'd hoped. It's that you'd placed your identity in fulfilling those dreams. That's the real struggle, the under-the-surface struggle. In other words, it wasn't just a dream that you had. It was how you measured your worth. It was how you measured your value. Now, this was an unconscious exercise for all of us, for the most part. But that doesn't change the fact that it happened. We do this. We instinctively do this. We, we place our identity in things that are transient, things that are not permanent, things that fade. Um, I think the most paralyzing form of lostness that we experience under the sun is when our roles become our identity. And we do this. All the time we do this. For instance, many retired people I've talked to have described a profound lostness of meaning now that their career is over. For so long they had located their identity in the work they did and all that came with it. And now that their role has changed, they experience a late in life identity crisis. I remember being in California probably five years ago and preaching at a church and telling my story and how I underwent an identity crisis in my early 40s because of some stupid decisions I made and everything that I lost as a result and how that exposed to me the things that I had previously placed my identity in. And so now that those things were gone, I didn't know who I was, which is a very scary thing to feel in your 40s. And a guy came up to me after the service, probably early, mid-70s, very successful businessman. I had made a lot of money, had a lot of power, a lot of influence, and he had retired a few years earlier. And he came to me and he said, look, I, I can't relate to your specific circumstances because that wasn't my story, but I can certainly relate to the identity crisis that you talked about because I recently retired and here I am in my 70s and I don't know who I am without the work that I had devoted my life to. The office that I went to, the employees that worked for me, the business deals that I was a part of, now that all that's gone, I don't, I don't know who I am anymore. Um... I mean, uh, I also see this with parents when they become empty nesters. For so long, their identity was anchored in being a parent and taking care of the kids. But when the kids grow up and move away, they lose their sense of purpose. The parents do. They lose their sense of significance. They don't know who they are or even what to do. Their role had become their identity. So when your roles become your identity, you experience an identity crisis every time your roles change, every time. And that creates so much of the stress and the tension that we feel in life because life continues to move forward. Every new thing we gain typically means that we've lost something, we've moved past something, we've moved past a certain age, we've moved past a certain stage. I stood up here probably six weeks ago or so um, and talked about how difficult it has been um, for me just to see. I love the fact that my kids, my three kids are older and they're on their own and the relationship we have is so good. They're three of my very best friends, but that doesn't mean I don't desperately miss the days when they were small. Uh, that stage in life that time, those Christmas mornings that were so early and yet so energetic and exciting, birthdays, all of that stuff, um, I miss that. Um, in an article called The Perfectionist Trap, uh, a writer by the name of Josh Cohen wrote this. Something about being human, young or old, makes it difficult to feel that we have done or are enough. And we are unwilling to extinguish the hope that one day we will be recognized as exceptional. 
And Henry Nowen, a writer that I greatly admire and respect, who's now dead, uh, said something similar when he said this, all day long we hear loud voices that demand, prove you are worth something, do something relevant, spectacular, or powerful, then you will earn the love you so desire, the identity you crave. Striving plagues the young and the old. Chasing after the wind is no respecter of age or stage in life. I think, as I mentioned just a minute ago, for me, the hardest part of aging is what I talked about, you know, six, four, five, six weeks ago, just the passing of time. We looked at that in Ecclesiastes 3. Uh, philosopher Peter Kreeft said, time is a river that takes from us everything it gives us. I feel that. I feel that acutely, more now than ever. I spend a lot of time these days reflecting, remembering, wishing I would have enjoyed more in the moments that I had. Thinking foolishly that this would last forever that these moments wouldn't pass. I spent so much time, like I said a minute ago, I loved the stage of my kids being young, but I remember spending time thinking about how much I was going to enjoy it when they were older, and I think there was a part of me that uh, missed out on what the moments had to offer because I was looking to the next moment, to the next thing, to the next season. I mean, I've always craved more than what I have, the next thing. I mean, this goes back to the time I was a kid. Um, I mean, I was always looking past the current moment to what the next moment might be or what the next, or what I want the next moment to be. When I got to college, I couldn't wait to get out of college and get to graduate school. When I was in graduate school, I couldn't wait to get out of graduate school to get on with my career. After I got my first job, I, I just couldn't stop thinking about what my next job was going to be. Um, all of that stuff. And when I became a pastor, I, I, wanted, I wanted this week's sermon to be better than last week's sermon. I, as an author, I wanted this book to be better than the last book. I was always chasing the wind. Speaking openly and honestly everywhere I went about the exhaustion of living on a performance treadmill while I was living on a performance treadmill. And I didn't, I didn't have the self-awareness back then to even really know what I was doing or why I was doing it. I was just sort of going through the motions. But loss and regret has a way of sobering you up making you more self-aware, making you think a little bit more deeply about what's under the surface of your life, under the surface of your heart and your desires. Um, and so I, I spend a lot of time these days reflecting, remembering, wishing. I live with regrets. We all do. Um, and, and even though I've learned a lot about slowing down and savoring the moment and not taking minutes for granted, time continues to pass and I can't stop it. I hate my birthdays now. <laughs> hate them. I used to love them when I was a kid. Um, but for some reason, just the, the passing of time and my inability to slow it down makes me sad these days. And it also scares me because I'm constantly asking myself, what am I missing? Am I missing out on something that I don't want to be missing out on? I don't want to make the same mistake twice. What should I be doing? How should I be spending my time? Is there any way to slow things down? Now, don't, don't get me wrong. There are many things I enjoy about getting older. Many things. Um, I think I'm freer than I was when I was young. Uh, I have more perspective now. I have a lot more appreciation for small things than I used to have. I care about people more. I think I'm a better listener because I care about people more. I think I'm more reflective. I, I think I'm more self-aware. I know and have accepted my limitations in a way that I couldn't when I was young. That's a good thing. It's a healthy thing. I see more. I hear more. I feel more. Things are quieter inside of me. These days, I think I'm, 
I'm very prone to being distracted, but I think I'm less distracted now than I was when I was young. I'm not always looking past the current moment to the next moment. I'm appreciating moments so much more. I'm more content than I used to be. I think I'm more comfortable in my own skin. I'm not as concerned about wanting what I don't have as much as loving what I do have. And those kinds of deep changes only happen with age. And so I'm very grateful for so many things that God has developed and has allowed me to experience as I get older. But with perspective and self-awareness and reflection also comes pain. I've already given voice to some of it. The passing of time, the missing out on things that I wish I could go back to. Time wasted, opportunities missed, a growing catalog of regrets. With self-awareness and perspective comes pain also. Because you see more, because you hear more, because you feel more, you experience more pain. Um, so while there are benefits to being young, there are also traps Locating our identity, placing our worth and our value and our significance and all the things that accompany youth. And while there are benefits to getting older, lots of them, there is also pain. Not just physically. Yeah, our bodies start changing and hurting and shutting down in a variety of ways. We become more physically aware of the things that we can't do the way we used to do. But that's sort of surface pain. It's the under-the-surface pain of getting older that I mentioned a minute ago. Just this a growing awareness of regrets, a reflection, or looking back over the years that you've been alive and wondering if you missed something, looking back at mistakes you made and wishing you could go back in time and fix those things, and you can't. None of us can. Um, so there are great benefits to being young. There are also traps and temptations. And there are great benefits to getting older, but there is also pain. And this is the point that the writer is making in these verses. This is precisely the point that he's making in verses 7 through 10. He's saying, youth is good, enjoy it, but don't let it define you. If you let it define you, then as you age, you are going to suffer even more. You're going to stand face to face with a long list of identity crises. I don't think I said that right. You're going to look down the you're going to look down the tunnel and just face identity crisis after identity crisis. So enjoy your youth, but don't let it define you. That's what he's saying. And then he also says, getting older does some good things for you. It develops you in ways that only aging can, but it also comes with pain. And just to put an exclamation point on everything he said, death awaits us all, young and old. That's why he says to the old and to the young in these verses that everything is meaningless because in the end we all die. And if there is no God and, and, and we experience life without God, then death is the end for all of us. And that's where we're all headed. Death claims 100% of the human race. Um, so that's the point that he's making. So once again, the writer concludes that everything and everyone in this world will fail you. In some way, and at some point, relying on an achievement, an experience, a person, a particular way that you feel, anything under the sun to be our ultimate source of meaning and purpose and identity is like building a house on the sand. He says over and over, it's like chasing after the wind, a type of treadmill existence that never really gets us anywhere, but it does get us tired. Thomas Merton, the American monk, may have been channeling Ecclesiastes when he pointed out that we may spend our whole life climbing the ladder only to find when we get to the top that our ladder is leaning against the wrong wall. 
He may have been thinking about Ecclesiastes, maybe not. And I've often wondered if, if Shakespeare was meditating on Ecclesiastes when he wrote these lines from Macbeth. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow. A poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. At least he's honest. An accurate description of life without God. So I'll try to put it even more plainly than Shakespeare and Thomas Merton. Apart from God, life is ultimately meaningless and hopeless. And once we realize this, once we have the courage to realize this, once we have the courage to acknowledge this, to admit this, it brings us to a place of despair where we are finally ready to hear good news. It brings us to our knees, to a place where we are finally ready to hear the gospel. I shared with the guys on Thursday night at the vault that Paul Zoll, my good friend, uh, told me in a time of severe crisis that when the student is ready, the teacher appears. We're not, it doesn't matter what someone says, the wisdom that someone may give us, the information that we get, if we're not ready to receive it, we will never hear it. It won't make any difference so he said, when the student is ready, the teacher appears, and Ecclesiastes makes us ready for the teacher, gets us there. It gets us ready to hear what we so desperately need to hear. We need some good news. In this world of bad news, in my life that is chock full of bad news, I need some good news, and I can't find it inside, and I can't find it in life under the sun. I need something from above the sun to give me hope something lasting, something eternal, something permanent. Not the transient stuff that I float from here in life under the sun. And the good news is that ultimate hope and peace and security and meaning comes from God, our creator who wired us created us to experience the beauty of things like purpose and meaning and value and love from nothing smaller than him. He created us. It's why St. Augustine said in his famous prayer that you have made us for yourself, O God, and our hearts are restless until we find our rest in you. We search high and low. Blaise Pascal echoed that when he said that we have a God-shaped void in our soul that only God is big enough to fill. And we spend our lives trying to fill it to no avail. To no avail. So all of the things we long for in the deepest part of our being, the, the hope, peace, security, meaning that we crave comes from God, not anything we do or anything we can become. It comes from God's love for us. It comes from God's approval of us. It comes from God's friendship to us, no matter what. His delight in us, no matter what. It's God's grace and mercy and forgiveness that gives us a reason to live and a reason to laugh, a reason to not take ourselves so seriously because we have nothing to prove. We have nothing to protect. We belong to God. Our creator defines us with his love, his acceptance. He doesn't wait for us to clean ourselves up and make ourselves acceptable before he welcomes us. It's his welcome of us that makes us acceptable. It's not our achievements or our failures, our wisdom or our foolishness, our abilities or our weaknesses, our regrets or our proudest moments that define us. God defines us. 
And his definition for us is singular, beloved. You're mine. You belong to me. Whatever you experience, whatever you do, the highs, the lows, the good stuff, the bad stuff, the, the strengths and the struggles, all of that stuff, you're mine. I don't welcome you and love you based on what you do, who you can become, or what you fail to do, or anything like that. It's not conditional. It's unconditional. And that is an incredibly difficult thing to believe. It is for me. It's much easier for me, for instance, to say that God loves sinful people than it is for me to say God loves me. Much easier to be generic about this stuff because we live in this conditional world. And so the whole notion of unconditionality is literally otherworldly. It, it goes against the grain of any logic that we may have regarding how things are supposed to work in this world. So if you're tired, like I am, of trying to make it on your own, tired of searching but never finding, tired of solutions that make your emptiness emptier, then stop chasing the wind. It's more tempting to do that when you're young than when you're old because you just get tired as you age. But that doesn't mean that we stop chasing after the wind even as we age in a different way maybe. But unlike the uncatchable wind that we chase, the wind of God's grace chases us. It catches us and it whispers to us, there's no need to chase any longer. What you've been chasing, what you've been searching for has found you. So relax, breathe, live, laugh. It is finished, full stop. Let's pray together. God, thank you for your mercies which are new every morning. Where would any of us be without them? We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. this time ushers can come down.
sight saw was 2020. Oh, I can look behind me. Such as how far I've gone. Seek me from the brink of falling. Mercy shutting doors before me. When it doesn't make sense and the future's unsure I look at my past and I see you there all alone So I know you're never gonna let me Oh, you are good You can only be you guys to keep going a little bit. That was so good. Thank you for leading us, Trey. I loved every song this morning. I usually love every song, so that's not really saying anything, but but today they were James, Baby James and I, if you saw him, he was on the front row. Baby James was on the front row, and we got Big James here on the cajon. Big James and Dina. Sweet Dina. She freaking rocks it. When she opens her mouth to sing, I, I, it literally is a little piece of heaven for me. It is. Yeah. Carl. Carl. We have another birthday today, so in a minute you're going to have to put, no, no, but in a minute he's going to play us another birthday tune because um, today is our picnic. You're invited. If you don't have a ticket, you should get one. And I'm recruiting for my team for the games. I think they're like four people per team. Is this right? A administrator Gary, game administrator. I'm recruiting three people. I'm taking resumes because I want to I want to win. So, you're in. You're in. Okay. And you got shoes. You have good shoes. So this is good. Um, it's going to be fun. There's food. If you don't have a ticket yet, you can get one in the lobby. Um, I'm sure there's someone out there to direct some some of us somewhere to go do things. Um, also, don't forget Tuesday night starts the Discover Women's 10-week workshop. Um, it'll be here at the sanctuary. It's free. There are no materials needed. Um, I'm really, really stoked about this thing. So if you have questions about it, come ask me. We'll talk or text me or message me or something. Um, and don't forget next Friday night, line dancing and barbecue. Come here. Come here, Haley. Come here. Come here. Right now. 
And her mom is here for the first time. We get to meet Mama Karen. So that was awesome, too. We love you guys. Come join us at the picnic. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. <laughs>